All right, everyone, I want to thank you all for the, the hard work at each table. Uh, we started our table discussion just by uh, introducing ourselves to each other, since even though we've been hearing comments from each other, we've been working together indirectly uh, on the network. Uh, this is the first time we'd had a chance to sit down and really meet face to face. Uh, I hope some of you all have had a chance to get to know at least your table participants a bit better uh, as a way of uh, continuing to, to, to build this network's working together. Um, what I'd like to do now is go around to each table and ask for your answers to, uh, to these two uh, discussion questions. Um, I think I'm going to start in the, the back for this part of the discussion. Uh, maybe, uh, let's see, what's the highest numbered table? <laughs> so uh, that's you guys, Amy. Yeah, don't <laughs> you guys up? Don't All right, and. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, hi, I think uh, table 14 is first, and. Um, one of the things that we felt like we hadn't heard about um, in the discussion of the last two days is about analysis of the data and information being collected and a plan to understand what the data look like, data quality, and um, data completeness um, over time and how important it's going to be ultimately for a research network working together that we actually understand how we can have meaningful information um, that comes out of this network. We talked about some practical strategies um, and two of the important steps are ultimately um, to collaborate uh, to figure out early data check quality and analytic plans um, that we can put in place over time and also perhaps some data visualization and um, picture-based solutions so that we can understand what data quality looks like across the network. Great. Thank you. A lot of data focus. Now, um, uh, Rob, Joe, Rachel, Rich, uh, if you all have any comments along the way, uh, please feel free to, uh, to, to step in. Uh, this is, uh, we're not expecting all of these issues to get addressed and solved today, but we did want to make sure they're, they're all out there. I mean, that, that really lives at the heart of the data standards and networking task forces charge. So, um, uh, it, it, if, 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 we, if we can't, it, that's what interoperability means, I think. So at least, at least for me. So um, uh, high up on the list of things to, to address is, uh, is for that task force to establish the, um, the, the ground rules for, uh, for quality and completeness of, of data. And that means some clarity about standards for the, the data models uh, yep. as well as. Uh, yep. We have to have confidence that um, um, that a, a, a question asked across the network will be answered in the same way um, by, by, by every respondent. It doesn't mean that every respondent has, has an answer to every question, but if the question is answered, it has to be answered in, in, in a way that everybody understands to be the same. Mark, Thanks. Mark, you know, I'm just a simple clinical trialist, and I, just <laughs> based on our experience in the collaboratory with um, a lot of um, very talented people. I think a lot of people will be surprised how hard it is to know for your patients what age they are, what sex they are, what race they are, and very common things like what is the blood pressure. So I think checking those periodically, from my view, is going to be an important, and I think it's baked into the milestones, actually, if you look at it. Thanks. I'll go to table 13. Uh, hi, so this is a theme that was raised um, throughout the last couple of days, but I think it's a theme that's really important, and our table did, and that is the theme of how we're going to ensure that there's effective patient engagement at every step of the way. So one of the things that we have is we're going to have um, an organizational structure that'll have task forces, an executive committee, and a steering committee. And the question becomes, as a group, how are we going to hold the space so that we're ensur ensuring that there'll be effective patient engagement in each of those? So for instance, on the steering committee, uh, you know, there's one slot per uh, you know, CDRN or PPRN. Mm -hmm. How are we going to ensure that there'll be enough voices of the patients on the steering committee? It's, you know, where the choices are going to be made by PPRNs in terms of who sits on the steering committee. And I would just encourage people to think about those choices, um, you know, long and hard in terms of holding the space. And the, this all wraps up into the concept of uh, you know, holding as a guiding principle the concept of patients first or developed by patients for patients. If we're going to have a transformation, it will be patient-led, so let's make sure that we have all of the ingredients that can make that possible. 
Thank you. That, uh, that key guiding principle has come up uh, repeatedly uh, throughout the last couple of days. Uh, any, any comments? Well, I, I would just say that um, the, the patient engagement task force, um, that is, I, I think we will look to that task force to make certain that uh, all of our efforts are keeping patient engagement uh, in mind as, as we move forward. So I think that's, that's the critical work of that task force. Um, as Aaron has pointed out several times, uh, there's a lot of overlap between the task force. So there'll be, able, and this one is, this one probably overlaps with every other task force. So there's opportunities to operate at the inter-task force level, but also we need to hear from, uh, at the steering committee level, from the patient engagement task force, um, how we're doing. So, uh, and I think that, uh, plus um, Sue Sheridan and, and Bray and Sean, um, um, we have some pretty sensitive eyes um, looking at us as well, and uh, and um, and it's going to be built fronting into the, pretty fearless people. So um, I'm, built I'm into not, the evaluation as well. Yep. So Joe, I just want to clarify that I think what Lorraine is trying to articulate from us is we get that there's a lot of sort of checks. But we want to make sure the balance is there to start with and that the representation of this okay. community. So, for example, if, and I don't know, you know, how many PPRNs picked their, I hate the word, patient, uh, to come here as the steering committee member and didn't send their MD or PhD. So I don't know the answer to that question, and that's a really critical question in our opinion, that that steering committee fundamentally is balanced and not that we're putting a check on it because there's too many PIs who are professionals. Good, and, and we have heard that before, and I think, um, again, we'll look to the task force to speak to us about the representation on the steering committee and whether it needs some modification. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn? It's part A and part B, sort of like all discussions. Um, one thing we hadn't heard at all was how will uh, Cornet build met methodology and data over the long haul that will drive more therapeutics into the pipeline to improve patient health? Um, and that we know that's a longer term goal, but I didn't, we didn't hear a lot about industry and what this will become as a tool into the future for accelerating new therapeutics, which led into part B, which is the measure of success of PCORI. We've been focusing sort of on a two-year um, horizon and a 10-year horizon outcome or impact needs to be built in to show that the result of this program is actionable outcomes that have been implemented and improved patient health or the delivery of health care. Yeah, I have a reaction to that because, um, you know, I've made a great living doing really expensive clinical trials, often industry funded, that take way too long to do. And there's no question that many potentially very beneficial therapeutics are being put on the shelf right now because of the cost, uh, the investment needed to even contemplate uh, getting through the clinical trials process. So we got two options. We can either uh, make the FDA a sieve and let everything through it and hope for the best, or we can reduce the cost of clinical trials by a log order. And I don't, one reason that I jumped at the chance to do this um, is I don't see any other option than this network. Uh, in city, we've looked closely with the FDA at all the incremental changes we can make in the system. None of them will get us where we need to be uh, to uh, encourage useful therapeutics to get put into the pipeline at a faster rate. We've got to have a dramatic change in the cost of getting answers. So that uh, I'm excited about it. And I, I think that's really what uh, a major part of what we need to do. Well, it's also, people should recognize that unless industry uses this network, it's unlikely to be sustainable because the infrastructure costs are just not sustainable unless there's a constant series of uh, funded research projects going through it. And I love the NIH, but it's limited. And, it, you know, its budget is always going to be limited. And, Marilyn, did you all have any I further thoughts about a uh, step to get industry engagement in this network? Or? We didn't solve the problem, but we just agreed that, that it is it an is, issue. An issue. <laughs> and Pharma was here yesterday, but I, somebody just made a point I really want to bring up, is what, some of what's broken is there is no drug discovery 
uh, coming out of biopharma anymore. It's got to come out of uh, academia, and there's no product coming out of academia yet um, that's filling that gap for just breakthrough compounds, et cetera. And this whole network can do a lot for both drug discovery as well as the development of new therapeutics. Great. Thank you. Let um, me go to table 11. So uh, Mike Besich from Pittsburgh. So the elephant in the room question for us that we haven't heard about is, so we have this great coalescence of extremely bright people in the PPRNs and the CDRNs, but most of us don't know how we're supposed to work together between those two things. It seems to me that PPRNs are already tasked to do what our CTR, CDRNs more enable. And I think it's a, maybe something worthy of considering quickly how we actually make the PPRNs and CDRNs learn from each other and actually do something meaningful starting out the gate. Uh, I don't think it was an accident that we're here together, but I haven't really seen how you know, we should use those two vehicles, uh, people that are walking already and folks that are building the sidewalk and the guide rails uh, for an infrastructure to essentially do things meaningful together. So the two things that we think we should do next are, you know, uh, the thing about PCORI that makes it unique from any other effort is the patient-centeredness. But uh, most of us in our group are confused about what patient engagement really is, how you define it. Is it different for PPRNs and CDRNs? Uh, when I've gone around and talked to the people uh, in the audience here about what do you mean by patient engagement, uh, it's very different and not clear uh, what that really will mean. So some kind of definition or framework about, at least for these two efforts, PPRNs and CDRNs, about how we're going to be measured for patient engagement would be useful. And I, you know, we've got a very detailed set of milestones at our site, and I'm not sure we're banging that set of milestones against uh, a definition that we all agree to. So we think that that should happen very quickly. Second thing, and I've said this before, uh, uh, in earlier comments, a library of best practices. We have extremely bright people. I've learned a ton from the hallway conversations in this network. Uh, there are a lot of great best practices right now before we even start. Uh, how are each of our efforts going to take advantages of that? So because the communications at PCORI are really spectacular compa compared to other uh, initiatives that I've been involved with, creating that uh, active librarian who will inform our SWAT team with the O uh, where the best practices are and carry them back to the institutions that are struggling with their start, I think is an important next step. So best practices library uh, starting today to evolve and be actively curated by PCORNet would be very valuable. Yeah, those, those are great comments. I don't know that they really need much of a response. Maybe one thing to be said is that on day one, I think that there probably is a difference in what we mean by patient engagement in the, in, in the two kinds of networks. I mean, we really um, um, stipulated that the PPRNs had to be groups of, of engaged patients, motivated patients. So if, if yours aren't, then get them engaged and motivated very soon. Get them engaged under, uh, up. in the CDRNs, most of, you know, 100% of the subjects don't really realize there's something going on. That should not be the case in the PPRNs today. So I think that the CDRNs have a, you know, obviously much larger populations, diverse conditions, uh, and, uh, uh, and overarching healthcare delivery systems that even control how they communicate with those patients. So all those are, are um, barriers that they've got to uh, overcome, and they'll do patient engagement differently. I think the PPRNs really ought to have uh, their rank and file involved in pushing and generating questions and participating in trials. So, so John, could, could you or Rachel articulate, it's been a lot of speculation about this, throwing the CDRNs and the PPRNs together into the same network, what was the dream, if you could articulate the end game, what was it that you wanted okay. to see happen? Well, uh, so we met a year and a half ago in Palo Alto, uh, and uh, frankly, I think, I think the name of the conference was uh, Exploring the Potential for Electronic Data Networks or something like this. It, it had a name like that. But we did manage, we were smart enough to in invite a few patient organizations 
to the meeting, and really, the you know, there was an aha moment where we realized that one of the huge problems with these networks is that the patients in the networks didn't know the research was going on, didn't respond any better than a random sample of the of the nation's population when you did research with them, and didn't uh, weren't doing anything in terms of hadn't even been asked to participate in trials. But if they were, there was no reason to expect they'd participate at any higher level. So it became clear that patient-powered networks, and the, and, the, and the phrase came right out of that meeting, had a lot to say because they were coming and saying, look, we've got uh, you know, 5,000 people and they're all very interested in research, that's why they're with us. And we recognized that they were a very highly selected group, not ideal for an epidemiologic study, but on the other hand, very interesting from the point of view of clinical trials. Some of them were already um, involved in clinical trials and we really thought that those patient-powered networks uh, would be a huge influence on the CDRNs, which had been proceeding for a number of years along this electronic data pathway, uh, and that the net mm. product would be engaged patients even in the CDRNs, higher response rates, and, and more possibility of doing clinical trials efficiently. So um, it just made all the sense in the world, and it was a genuine aha moment, and, and, we, and we haven't backed away from that at all. It's a, it's a great goal, and hopefully with more of the suggestions from this group, we'll find some ways to get there. I know we're, we're going we're gonna to get to the table. I do want to keep moving along, though, to make sure we hear from everybody. Okay. Um, we had similar comments, and I'll try and highlight what's different. Um, we spoke in response to the first bullet point about the overlap between the CDRNs and PPRNs, um, and we had three sub-bullets on that. The first is, what if patients are in both, and if that person is contacted by both, how do we make sure that the patients aren't confused without a unifying identifier, the patients or participants or engaged people? Um, the second is that we felt really um, strongly about making sure that both groups are um, translated for and informed by each other. And I have two exemplar sub-bullets for that, which is that we need to make sure that data models are able to be implemented in the PPRNs and that data models can be implemented by smart people, not just by smart informaticians, and um, that the CDRNs need to learn how to engage patients, and we can learn that very well from the PPRNs, mm -hmm. but the PPRNs need to remember to talk to us like we are not necessarily people who engage patients all the time. So we both need to learn to translate for each other. And the two things that keep us up at night are that our first successes need to be exciting projects that engage people in the network, including our practitioners and communities. And we want to see that early for an early win to keep these networks energized. And that we're all worried about making our cohort numbers and are excited to get into the field shortly. <laughs> okay, thanks. All, all good points actually reinforcing uh, the, the points from the last table. Okay, Sarah Green from PCORI. Um, our table focused on three things and mostly in response to question one, although I think your responses might help feed into question two. Um, first, also goes back to what, what Mike from table 11 said, how will um, we achieve collaboration across between CDRNs and PPRNs? In particular, learning very rapidly about the strengths, capabilities, and um, opportunities. What do people want to work on together? and you know, what's the process for making those visible. Uh, the second was um, a concern has been raised about the lack of diversity and homogeneity in this room, um, in, in that there may not be the ability to effectively represent and engage with disenfranchised and vulnerable populations. Um, so that's something for us all to keep in mind, I think. And then finally, I'm happy that this came up spontaneously at my table because it riffs on a couple of hallway conversations I've had with people over the past couple days is that we need a very clear and concrete articulation of what success will look like in 18 months. So what is the vision? What can people take back to their organizations that is coherent, a rallying cry, but that's also very um, tangible? So that was that, those were our three, and it looks like I nailed it because our table's nodding, so great. Um, Mark, can I just say a quick thing about the, the PPRNs and the CDRNs? So, so part of why you're all here together is that so you build some of these relationships independently of us because we, um, between PCORI staff and the Coordinate Center, we're, we cannot, um, we, we can enable and facilitate, but we can't think of everything. And so we hope that you will, between yourselves, come up with some great ideas and some great collaborations sort of, um, and then come back to the group to share them. So I really encourage you to be proactive about that 
um, and not depend on us to, to, to push all of the, these things forward. Mark, let me just react to the point number two about diversity. Um, I, I think, l looking at the room, I don't think this is male and female anymore, at least in this, uh, in this field, but certainly the African-American representation is um, tiny. And I talked with our FDA representative on the way out. She was the first African-American MD, PhD graduate from Duke and had told me some interesting stories about her experience there. But I think this is, in the field of health services research and biostatistics and informatics, there's a particular deficit that's very quantifiable. And in fact, in the collaboratory, we got the first minority supplement that the Common Fund had ever given because there were absolutely zero African-American representatives on the steering committee. And I think, you know, here we are uh, again. So this is an area that we definitely need to um, work on and, and keep in mind. I think it also relates to the one part of the patient engagement that's particularly interesting to me. They're, they're patient advocates um, who are desperately needed and tremendously effective as shown by this meeting. And then you've got this very large group of um, patients who um, may not be articulating even with the advocates at this point. I think the beauty of the CDRNs potentially is that since these are people in health systems, if we can figure out how to um, get the communication going completely to um, people who are just getting health care right now, um, it could make a big difference. But I certainly don't know how to do that. So it's going to be an interesting experience. Thank you. Very quickly. Yeah, okay. Just about getting the CDRNs and the PPRNs together. Um, you know, some of them seem obvious, like if I'm in rheumatic diseases and kids, I'll talk to the person who's rheumatic diseases and. Um, but some of the other things, it's really hard. From reading, you know, two paragraphs, um, there's no way to really know where the intersections may be. And um, I, I think to leave it all up to us, the room is too big for me to meet with everybody. Um, and I, I think we could use some help. Maybe some specific focus yeah. areas yeah. to start with. Next the the, uh, the one other thing to be said here, I, I'm, I'm really delighted to hear that several CDRNs, several, uh, maybe even a majority, but a number of CDRNs brought PPRNs or PPRN-like organizations uh, along in their proposals. So I think we're going to have some early examples of, of efforts that will inform us. But I take your point that we may be able to do some kind of a grid that, that, um, that indicates particular areas of expertise or interest at the level of the CDRNs in some of the PPRN populations. I do want to make sure we get no, all the tables only, on. And, and only me, Peter. Yeah. Only me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Joe, so Joe, we're, we're um, going to come back, Peter. Don't, don't worry. All right, I, I do want to go on to. All right. I'll, I'll do it. I've got it right. <laughs> all right, so a couple of points, mostly to the first bullet point. So the first um, point we surfaced was that CDRNs and some PPRNs certainly are networks of networks themselves. And so we've already seen some challenges in the responsivity that we are supposed to have. So there are questions that are asked, often questions that we have to go back to our constituencies. And we certainly felt it in our PPRN, in Jennifer and her CDRN. And so we wanted to raise that issue to note that there's going to be some things you ask of us that is going to take a little bit longer. That's what participant-centric means, and some things that we might be able to answer pretty quickly. And if we can figure out um, maybe even 80 to you know 90 percent of those and, and, and have two pathways, that would be very helpful. Um, so that was one. Second little controversial, so that one we all agreed on. Second little controversial at our table, um, we wanted to bring up the issue around transparency, which is a word we've used a lot here. And I'd I'll add accountability that usually goes with transparency. And so the broader question is to, to bring that back to the steering committee, to all of us, to ask, well, what does that mean for us? And especially since we want to be patient-centric, participant-centric, transparency and accountability will be key. One specific suggestion that I know is controversial would be to take our proposals, our ideas on our networks that we presented to you that have now been reviewed and accepted, and make those public. I realize lots of pieces of those, for example, there's data in the CDRN ones, I know for sure that people may be sensitive about, but that's the kind of thing we should consider, whether we go down that path or not is for everyone in this group to decide on, but maybe we get there in phase two, and when you have a call for proposals, that's a requirement that we finally have to share everything that we proposed. But that's the kind of thing that I think this group could do and really change the bar of what it means to be transparent and accountable. Before we 
go, there's one last very tactical thing that was in many of our minds, which is uh, answering the second bullet point, <laughs> which is the first thing that we, m many of us want to do is to sign our contracts. And it's still very, very confusing um, <laughs> to us because for many, uh, the, for many, some of the milestones are not understandable. So it's rare that we can sign contracts when we don't understand some of the things we have to deliver to. So that's just a tactical piece that I think is on our minds, some of our minds. Okay. Thank you all. Any uh, comments? Well, I, I think with regard to, to sharing uh, the I information that's, that's, that, the, uh, um, that the awardees have already made available, what will be easy is to, uh, is to make available the information that, that, you, that you indicate is shareable. Um, but be, be, beyond, beyond that, um, if, if, it was, if it was offered as a confidential communication, I, uh, I, I think we'll have to, to live with that. Uh, the, 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 the radical data liberation movement um, can only be enhanced by having uh, people lead, lead voluntarily to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to make inf put information in the, in the, in the shared space. I, I think um, one thing to be said is that PCORI's methodology committee is very, um, um, uh, people interested in open science and, and as well as transparency are very uh, well represented on that on that committee. So I think that they, they will join us uh, in, in a discussion of what open science and open data actually mean. I think, but m earlier than that, transparency in our methods is critical for a host of reasons, one of which is we'd like other people to keep an eye on us and, and prepare to join us. So, so um, uh, thanks. So um, at our table, we had uh, um, three uh, things that we hadn't heard of uh, before. And I think the first thing was a question, how to harness uh, social media technology? And that, was, that came up in terms of patient engagement. When we were talking about patient engagement, actually patients are already very engaged on, on the internet, online, and social media. And, and the fear is, is as we're now putting out surveys and asking them for information, is, are we in, in PCORI creating another parallel stream of, of, of patient engagement, and why aren't we directly connecting to the social media that's, that's out there. And so, so if people are, are developing methods there, can we share and learn from those? Um, I think uh, uh, we also had that PPR and CDRN interaction uh, question, so I'll skip that. And I think the third uh, um, thing that came up was we touched upon yesterday in terms of the, the main research question or, or questions coming out of um, this, these 18 months and if we uh, know what kinds of questions we want to answer collectively, wouldn't that shape what kind of data we collect together? And, and as we're talking about clinical trials and other things, uh, it, it, maybe it's good to you know, pose those questions or, or early on in, uh, in order to streamline things. I think that was the main issues. On, on this last point, did you have a suggestion for a mechanism to get those questions posed earlier on, or you just want to make sure the, uh, that the core net does bring that up? I, I think just at our table, we had the sense that we, dis we discussed it yesterday, but you know, obviously it's a big question, but there was no consensus reached. And uh, maybe there's a way of, 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 of trying to aim for that sooner. Just on, on the social media thing, I'm just, um, I got this from our um, group, which is following social media here. The, there have been 1,110 plus visitors to the PCORI, uh, PCORNet uh, website during this meeting. 43% uh, increase in Twitter followers related to the kickoff meeting. Uh, 1,144 tw uh, tweets, I guess, reaching, um, if you consider the network of people who follow those who tweeted, uh, 1.259 million potential readers. So it is, you know, I don't know what all this means. I, you know, I just, <laughs> I, just, I just learned how to tweet a couple of days ago, and I've been tweeting a little bit here. But um, anyway, it does show you that these numbers can be astounding. And, um, what, what it, and, uh, <laughs> and, and for those of you who are either in the room and not following yet or are uh, uh, on the, the web meeting, uh, it's hashtag PCORNet kickoff uh, to get into that uh, Twitter discussion. 
Thank you. So for the first point, we heard a lot about what we have ahead of us, and we're really excited about that. But we felt that we needed a little more information on logistics and how we're actually going to go about it. For example, um, the contracting process, how we can receive assistance, someone had mentioned in deciphering milestones, the surveys for the CDRNs, and then more importantly, the task force has walked away with a lot of kind of specific to-dos and responsibilities, but what are the next steps for the task force? How is the communication going to happen? I know there will be some plan for in-person meetings, but what's the organization and structure going to look like for that? And then for the two steps for each of us to consider, um, the first one was already echoed before about the diversity, um, not just in this room, but you know, I would exhort uh, PCORI, the coordinating center, the executive leadership to really take seriously the need to be representative itself, even if that means changing around things, because sometimes that change is necessary. And then for each of us to really think hard about how we can engage disenfranchised patients, because each of us serve, and speaking on behalf of an advocacy organization, I serve a populace that is um, you know, low income, that has a hard time just getting to the clinic, and not everybody is as well engaged as you know, the chart that Bray showed us and how do we engage patients at the very first level and us going to them instead of, you know, expecting them to come to us. And for our second point, if there are any specific ideas for social technology or social networking technology support for how we're going to communicate with each other. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words. So, um, so in terms of communicating with each other, um, Kim Lane, who's the project director of the Coordinating Center, has a whole team uh, setting up a communication platform. So you'll hear more about that from, from her team uh, shortly. Um, in terms of the contract, so I've, I've heard it twice now. So, um, so your program officers at PCORI are available to you. You've all, um, you've all had your first one-hour kickoff call with them uh, prior to this meeting, but they are absolutely... Um, open to you, and this is their main job is to really make sure that you that you onboard smoothly. So please reach out to them, and they'll um, they'll help you with understanding the milestones, um, the contracting. We've also heard um, bits and pieces about that. We our contracts team is uh, working on um, a second round of edits to the contract, and you'll be hearing from them soon, so that we have one contract to go back out. But we we absolutely are aware that this is a, a major issue, and we will. Um, uh, we, we're working hard to make sure you get your contracts. Uh, thanks, Rachel. So uh, we want to echo uh, some of what was said previously about more focus on um, our longer-term purpose. Um, understanding what we want to do over the next three to five years is going to be really important in uh, helping us sort out how we're, what we, what we can achieve in the next 18 months, and we think. That the longer term purpose will help us form more as a community. And this grew out of a conversation for us about uh, the value proposition um, and uh, the importance of thinking about this as more than just a research network if we're going to engage all the stakeholders like uh, health system uh, leaders who will in the long term need to make an investment in this. Um, and uh, along those, uh, to help keep this in front of us, uh, we think we need to have some measures, uh, some longer term measures that start going up in very shortly so that every month we can have those in front of us and so that we're really keeping our eye on the ball. Um, Any suggestions on the measures? Uh, well, uh, impact on outcomes would be <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, research Measures of research efficiency might be another. Um, uh, yeah, changes in uh, the quality of care that's getting delivered and innovations that are getting produced might be another. I sure like the outcome orientation. Uh, any comments? Well, um, I, I totally agree that those are the longer term outcomes. You know, the next six months might be a little premature to, uh, um, to measure those, except in a, in a pure baseline sense. Um, one measure, and this is, I don't mean to um, sort of paint engagement into some kind of a box to say that engagement is all about increasing participation, but I think an, an early test of our capacity uh, to do research differently uh, is uh, participation rates in a, in a wide range of studies. Um, and, and, and perhaps also some um, that could be conceivably linked together is just um, uh, measures of the attitudes of, of patients in these networks, of, of, of the participants in these networks, awareness of the network, and, and attitudes toward research there. So those are the kinds of things we'd like, like to see change early on. They'd be 
harbingers of good things to come. Thanks. Uh, on to table four. Hi. So I'm uh, Jonathan Neveker from uh, Veterans Affairs. The, from our table, a lot of repeated themes. I'll skip over those very quickly. Uh, milestone anxiety, contract anxiety. Uh, I don't want to get anybody fired, but uh, we heard that there may be a possibility of pulling back from some of the non-standard, more ambitious milestones that were proposed in exchange for doing milestones that we did not have on our list that you want us to do, so that you can maybe address that. Uh, second is uh, for communication, uh, both between PCORI, the research networks, within the research networks, as far as things we need to get done, uh, and also with between the research networks and the greater home organizations. All these things need to be worked out very quickly. And then uh, finally, the second uh, um, major, uh, most important next steps is to set up a very robust patient engagements. Uh, but within, uh, so for especially for some of us who were who have you know are within academic institutions or. We, we're, we're within a, a greater research organization, also healthcare system. This, uh, these engagements need to be set up in the context of that organization so that they can truly be effective and robust and eventually scale out to the rest of the organization. So um, this is a, a very deliberate process, especially for those with, from the larger organizations we have to work with in the policies. And so that's, uh, it'll be very interesting to hear, you know, get these libraries from others and how we can figure this out. Go ahead, Joe. So the, several people have asked about what would success look like or, or, or what, are we, what are we really talking about, really expecting here. And, and I, you know, I, I said a little while ago, and I say again, that uh, the milestones still reflect what it is that, that we're looking for. Some of those milestones might um, be uh, modified uh, through the wisdom and the advice of the task forces, but I think there will still likely be activities related to every one of those milestones as part of the deliverables of this contract. But that really, the, the bottom line, and I want to be clear about this, the bottom line, as it has always been, is a cohort of patients completely covered, or as completely as possible, covered with clinical data that can be followed longitudinally and the capacity to rapidly um, uh, conduct multi-network research that draws on comparable data uh, from those cohorts. So that's that's the bottom line, and, and all of the other uh, milestones and all the other task forces um, are intended to, to make research in this cohort um, more patient-centered, more efficient, and, and, and more effective. Thanks. Go ahead, Peter. I just want to say that uh, Table 3 loves the milestones, and we have no concerns whatsoever. <laughs> um, so, um, Next table. <laughs> um, we never met a milestone we didn't like. So uh, we, uh, you know, it sounds like a, a broken record, but I think broken would be the wrong word. I, I do I want to just editorial comment. Thank you for the money. You're giving me money. Being paid by Bakori. Um, <laughs> I would say uh, that all this, you know, the, the discussions got in, not heated, but more enthused. I think, it's, I, I think it is a manifestation of enthusiasm. I think this has been a, a very exciting meeting. Uh, I was talking to my uh, patient advocate partner, Joyce, and, and she's saying, you know, this is, it, it's daunting, but incredibly exciting. So I think that is a summary. We had, uh, not surprising, we had also as our number one uh, question, uh, still questions I think hasn't been answered, probably because we can't answer it yet. You made that clear how PPRNs and CDRNs will mesh. And I think, um, I'll, but a little twist on that. Our second point, by the way, is so we get in before I forget, is what is phase two and what do we need to do to get there? And it's not just self-serving because we want to get funded phase two, which we do, but it's because it will help us build what we're doing in phase one. So I think getting that on the table soon will be helpful. But our, uh, since he left, we can talk about him. Another CDRN um, made it clear that, you know, he has a lot of pressure to work with the groups that he's already aligned with some of whom are not in the PPRNs here. They're sort of outside PPRNs, leaving little room or space for those of us who are sort of orphan PPRNs without a CDRN. And I think there's tension and problems there. So I guess the question is, how do you mesh the doings, the mechanics? And I would go back to what I've talked to um, to Platt about, which is, uh, which is take us through, if a patient is in a, our registry in a PPRN, patient A, or patient B is in a CDRN, but not in ours, but has their disease. How do you follow their data through a study 
where does it all go? What's the role of the PPR and CDRNs and the coordinating center? And if we can answer that of where it looks like in 24 months, we'd understand where we're supposed to go. And I don't show up we're there. That's a challenge for us. And, and uh, Peter, did, did you get a chance to get into this comment, the earlier comment that you wanted to make in the session? Yeah. Is that, that, that's I, built in there? I, okay. I yeah, I, 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 I totally believe that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, t t the PPRNs will all be together tomorrow. And so we, we have yeah. a, a, a chance to extend this. And Peter, I'm sorry, you can't be there, but I'll try to channel you. Uh, huh, that won't work very well. But. Uh, um, but I, but I, I, th I think we can can try to do some some gaming of uh, of, of what the possibilities are. Um, I think it was never intended that the PPRNs could only be effective by partnering with a CDRN. Uh, but there clearly are some <coughs> so, some great opportunities if we can can make that work. So uh, I, I, I'm hoping that tomorrow we be, begin to explore that space, even though the CDRNs can't be be part of that conversation. So but we just don't want to be parallel universes, which you don't you know, yeah. Never I mean, right. th this theme of CDR and PPR and interaction has come up repeatedly during this session. I don't know if any, any of the rest of you well, have any comments. I, so I, I'm not sure what the framers' no, intent was, but <laughs> it, 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 it seems to me this is one of those emergent concepts of uh, now, now that we're all together, there are a lot of uh, very appealing possibilities. First of all, of the existing organizations uh, starting to link together. but. As, as part of the, the, the calls that Rob and I had with, uh, with, with all of you, we were very interested to hear um, uh, sort of the very thoughtful ideas about the way the CDRNs writ large might serve to greatly amplify the, the uh, populations that, that might uh, be, uh, be offered the opportunity to affiliate with a PPRN. So there's, there's a whole lot to do in, in, in this space, and I, I, you know, we just have to um, we have to think through what the possibilities are, and then and then uh, and, and then get it slotted so that uh, we can take advantage of the best ideas while accomplishing all the other things that that we've got to do. Yeah, I, I just add that um, I, I don't think we uh, it wasn't real high on the on the radar screen as we sent the the um, funding announcement out. This notion uh, that CDRNs and, and PPRNs might find a common ground and work together. Uh, we mentioned it, I believe. I, I think it's, the idea's grown on us certainly over time. And I think what's really interesting is that this room has picked up on it and, and uh, seen that both for avoiding overlap and duplication and also for growing and getting better data, um, uh, there's a lot of reasons to think about it. We never envisioned some mass uh, wedding um, 12 months into the project, <laughs> but um, um, you know, if a few engagements and, 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 and marriages happen uh, in the family, that's just great. And, and I think we'll celebrate each one and, uh, and we'll try to learn from them. Hey, Peter, one, one, one thing related to what you brought up that just got my attention, and uh, Rich is right, I think it was really evident to us in the calls, the opportunity that's here in that regard. While I think it would be great if there are some particularly strong alliances to develop, I would hope the spirit is more about building a platform that could be generic to any PPR, PPRN. If you're on the six toes PPRN and you want to find everybody with six toes across all the CDRNs, I think the issue is what are the computable phenotypes that would enable you to go to any CDRN and find those people and what are the highways by which you can interact with those people. I think that's the work of the task forces. Now, if we have some exemplars that develop because of close connections, that's good. But if those exemplars are thought of as closed shops, then I think that would be um, not in the spirit of what at least I would hope would, would happen. Um, I, I just want to say a few words again about the PPRNs and the CDRNs and why they both sort of appeared in the funding announcements is that if you go back to what Joe said about the, the core purpose of this network, which is to really be able to have longitudinal patient data I mean, we saw two ways of going about that. One was at the health system level, where there's health plan claims data, EHR data. But the other is at the patient level, the real grassroots level, where they activated, engaged, can find ways to collect their data for the purposes of research. And so we were sort of going at it from these two very different angles. And I think that was really the, the genesis of why the two funding announcements came out. And I think now today, we see that you all here have different ideas and different uh, see different opportunities in how to to merge these two worlds, and, and, um, and that's exciting, too. 
Hi, I'm Vance Bauer from the Advanced CDRN, Portland, Oregon. And we had a very engaged discussion and reached a lot of similar points that have already been raised um, around the, again, the one issue was really focusing on the linkage between the PPRNs and CDRNs, but really with a focus of making the clinicians within the CDRN health systems aware of the work of the PPRNs with a way of actually adding patients to those registries. So I thought that was a very kind of unique point that was raised, as well as, again, adding to the research agenda, getting the collaboration going to help identify research priorities across the CDRNs and PPRNs, um, and also identifying resources for these providers to, to know that these PPRNs are, uh, exist and are available through this partnership in the network, uh, PCORnet. Um, and then t uh, related to the lines of uh, idea generation, uh, some of the important things to work on, we realize that there's not this formal mechanism for sharing research ideas and building collaborations. Um, it's been mentioned through the Coordinating Center about supporting communication platforms, and I think a focus of that could be on if there's a funding opportunity coming out and there's shared interest, how do we bring people together in a formal way, support a mechanism formally as opposed to a more informal kind of discussion that we're having so that we can react quickly to funding announcements and opportunities. And then uh, one of the other things that we felt was really important to moving forward, and it's been raised before, that there's gonna be decisions that the task force make that are going to impact the work of the CDRNs. And if we get too far ahead of the task forces, because we're trying to meet those milestones, are we gonna be going off in a direction and then have to veer right or left? So for the, I guess the ask is for the task forces to identify those critical decisions that need to be made early so that the CDRNs and PPRNs can make sure that we're aligned and, and you know, heading in the right direction. Thanks, uh, comments? Long okay, agreement. Now, th this was my table, so I get to add a little bit uh, on here too. I think mm -hmm. the sense in this this last topic that was brought up about uh, really following through on on research questions and bubbling them up, the right questions for priorities for the overall network. Um, there is a, a lot of uh, interest in what the obesity task force has been doing because it's generated some good questions. And Rich talked about some of those uh, yesterday, but uh, wondering if there was some parallel mechanism that could be adopted by the network in other specific research areas that, that a number of, you know, critical mass that PPRNs might be interested in uh, or that could be a, a, another good focus area for work by the overall network. Uh, maybe a, just a better way to, to bubble up the, uh, the, the key priority research ideas that the network could get behind. Our undiscussed item is basically that task force issue is it could be, un, I won't know, it's not a disaster might be the right word, but on one hand we have milestones and contracts which were aggressive and now we hear we're going to throw a national trial on top of it in the year which is even more aggressive, but on the other hand the task force are going to tell us how to align it and do it all. So it's almost, there's a very practical problem of a royal, we refer to it in our development shop at, at a KU as the royal we. We will do something. And then you look around at the end of the meeting and who was the we who's gonna set the decision that's gonna let you do something. So we really have a challenge there because as, P, especially for PPRNs, this was from the PPRN people at the table. On one hand, they see all these task forces and say, gosh, I gotta participate in that to know sh I'm pointed in the right direction. But then I turn around and realize I've got all this work to do to meet my milestones and be effective. So that is the one we think is um, undiscussed that, that needs serious consideration. In terms of the next steps for us, for us CDRNs, it's the survey. I think our view, and we probably blew it in the GPC on what the survey meant exactly and how we should have budgeted for it. So we really need clarity, especially for the obesity cohort of how we know we're, we're counting enough people, but yet we achieve 50% or at least some reasonable target of uh, you know, filling out the survey. Uh, the other error, and then that in turn, you can't do a survey unless it's approved by the IRB, and that raises the whole issue of IRB reciprocity, which is developing your IRB model, which again gets to the governance input. So I think we're probably gonna have to blaze ahead in some ways, uh, th and uh, you know, to Ken's point, if you had this task force that met once a month for an hour, you know, that's gonna be a really efficient task force if it's gonna hit decisions after a couple months. Um, so, and then the second point 
is probably technical infrastructure, especially for the PPRNs, is really developing that. You know, it's more maybe than you initially uh, thought about when you went into this endeavor. And I think the parallel, at least for me, in the CDRN world is what are the plays that this network has to do as a team? And getting them really written down, especially for the RCT components, so we can work with the vendors, at least in our network, to make sure we can play the plays that are highest priority for the overall network. Any comments? I'll just say a quick word about the PPRNs. I mean, I think um, that, that we, also, we always expected, and then it did play out after the review, that there would be a real diversity um, in terms of the PPRNs coming in and what data they had. And so we're, we do think there'll be several tracks with PPRNs. So a success for some PPRNs will be different from others. And I think as we get to know you and as we um, as this plays out, there, there will be different uh, sets of milestones that will be success for different PPRNs. So we're aware of that. There won't be one size fits all. Yeah, I just, I mean, I think Rich and I both brought this up with Rachel as we were making our calls. And uh, I mean, the answer should be reassuring to the PPRNs. I think some of them are coming in with um, very detailed databases already in place and extensive studies already done, and others are starting at a, you know, a much more rudimentary level. And the real opportunity is to learn from each other about how to do things better. So uh, one, I think in the PPRNs, one, you know, it, there's going to be an understanding of uh, best faith effort. And um, that, that should, have an, should be reassuring, I hope. Well, I just want to thank all of you for a terrific session. Uh, in terms of next steps for developing uh, PCORE net capabilities, you all raise a lot of questions. But I think in just about every case, you at least came up with uh, directions for the answers or, or got some uh, uh, responses that suggested directions for the answers. So whether it's uh, CDRN and PPRN interactions, how you know the CDRNs can maybe help uh, expand PPRN participation, and conversely, how the uh, that the PPRNs can help uh, the, the CDRNs do uh, their research more effectively, whether it's uh, uh, clarity about the short-term uh, uh, vision of success uh, and how it fits into the longer-term goals, uh, whether it's uh, disenfranchised patient engagement and making sure that this is a network that uh, really does uh, provide useful evidence for uh, all patients. I think, uh, Joe, uh, some really good suggestions for achieving the, the bottom line goal that, uh, that you emphasized of getting to large scale quickly for efficiently developing evidence that patients can really use uh, with their clinicians in, in making decisions. So uh, a great session. I want to give a special thanks to all of you for leading it. Thank you. And we are just about to wrap up, but I'd like to, before we do that, uh, turn to Joe and some of the rest of the panel for a few uh, final thoughts and comments before we do that. Um, thank you, Mark. Thanks very much for a fantastic job of leading us over these two days. Um, I um, have already sort of outlined this, this notion that I did want to emphasize before the end of the day of, of you know, what success would look like, and so I think I've done that. I, I would just say that we, we really hear what uh, Russ uh, outlined very clearly, that this, the tasks and the milestones, many of them um, are interdependent uh, between, several, between several task forces, and uh, the urgency is not uh, lost on us. I don't know if it was you or somebody said that if a task force meets once a month for an hour, uh, but that's not the plan. I don't think that's the plan at all, and I think you know it will be up to the task forces to figure it out, but I think the amount of time they will meet, I mean, that's where a lot of the work will be done, so I think it's way more than an hour a week, and as, as Rich said earlier, it will be getting uh, underway very quickly, and, and your advice uh, just um, paints a nice uh, rationale for why it has to get underway immediately. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I'd say is just uh, that we did hear a lot of passion in the room uh, over the last couple of days as well. And uh, you know, on the one hand, we hear passion from patient organizations who either uh, are patients or represent patients um, who have a real urgency about uh, getting better evidence and, and, and better treatments. Um, but the other thing to be said is that this room is filled with people who are passionate because uh, uh, they've chosen uh, careers in, in this area, in, in, in clinical research and in informatics research, and uh, we are um, really very fortunate to have both groups uh, together here. And uh, I, I, I think um, a message that occurs to me as, one, as you go home to talk to patients and patient organizations is that uh, here at, at Picornet, you are hooked up with a, uh, a bunch of good 
of good people, good researchers as well. So you've got the right researchers uh, in the room. Um, I uh, also liked uh, uh, Eric Schneider's description of, of his role, which is that uh, he, he, he is evaluating us not as individual CDRNs and PPRNs, he's evaluating us as PCORnet, and, and I think it's very good uh, for us all to keep in mind that we're uh, absolutely in this together. Um, uh, I'll just say one more time how much, um, although the work gets done in the task forces, there's, uh, I think one thing we really have to figure out through the coordinating centers how the task forces are able to, you know, oftentimes meet simultaneously and then still communicate with each other. And, uh, and um, uh, that's, that's pretty much all I've got to say, except I look forward to the first round of task force meetings. So. Uh, I, I, I think any of us who, uh, who, who doesn't uh, feel challenged by uh, what we've got to do in, in a time that feels too short to accomplish it is, hasn't really uh, understood what we've all undertaken to do. So, uh, so that's a, a, a shared sense. I will say uh, that we, we view the Coordinating Center as a service organization, and so um, I want to make sure that you, you feel you um, uh, can, uh, can draw on the Coordinating Center uh, for things we, we have, have said uh, are, are our functions and to, and to propose others. Um, if, 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 it become, if, if it seems to you that there are, are, are critical functions that don't belong to a task force, let us know about that. If your task force uh, or, just, or just you as individuals think that there are, are services that the uh, coordinating center might take on on behalf of multiple networks to avoid redundancy, uh, we'll, we'll sure uh, try, try to listen to that. I bet that Aetna doesn't want to hear from 29 different organizations about linking to their organizations. So I, th there are a number of things that might work better with a, a centralized optional service, and we'll, we'll listen to those things. I think if, uh, if, you, have, uh, if you have any, any good ideas, uh, um, please feel free to, to, to write or call me. If you have complaints, please direct them to Rob. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to be, uh, to be responsive. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, just add to that. Sure, bring your complaints, uh, what the heck. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, for me, uh, th this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I think the people who are smart enough to think of this, whoever they were, at Selby at all, we'll just say the framers of the um, idea, Realize that uh, the real issue is that right now patients and their healthcare providers and administrators don't have enough answers. And I like the way, I think it was Janet, I get people confused yesterday, said, you know, we talk about evidence, but what patients want is answers. And so uh, I grew up playing basketball, so I apologize for the sports analogy, but to me, the real issue here is not how pleasant are the um, timeout huddles. If we have wonderfully uh, pleasant interactions and excellent huddles, and we love talking with each other. But at the end of the game, uh, we look up and we've lost on the scoreboard. Um, it hasn't worked. And the real score for me is uh, 18 months from now, will we have a national network which is capable of answering a lot more questions a lot more quickly? And the milestones, uh, we, Rich and I didn't devise the milestones. We, we participated a, a bit. But I believe they really are set up to have a network which is capable of answering questions 18 months from now. I'll just add to that another theme that I've heard uh, uh, constantly about since um, everybody was selected is there is a longer term, much more elegant big picture that I think a lot of us would love to see happen. But um, it needs to, I think we need to keep that in mind, but in the interim, um, 18 months from now, we need to be ready to answer some questions at a fairly rapid rate. And anything that you all can do that will help us get there quickly that would make it better, um, we'll support from the coordinating center side. And um, I, I, I hope that we'll just keep, you know, we want to have, we, we want to be a competitive team 18 months from now, not just a group that's had a bunch of nice uh, meetings along the way. Rachel, any uh, final thoughts? All right, well, um, as you know, it takes a lot to get a meeting like this together. Um, it took uh, the effort from the PCORI staff, and actually, there, you know, there are too many people involved in this name, the PCORI staff, 
the staff from uh, Duke and Harvard Pilgrim, who are part of the coordinating center, uh, the staff here at Brookings. I could, uh, one of these days, we'll, we'll start rolling credits for this whole uh, uh, network effort. Uh, it's going to take a while uh, because of all the people involved. Um, but uh, what I think you saw over the last couple of days is a lot of ideas come forward that can help accomplish the goal that Rich just described, so that Rich and Rob just described, which is how do you make uh, this 18-month effort and then the longer-term effort for much more meaningful evidence for many, many more people uh, throughout this country. How do you make that effort a success? Uh, we still have a long way to go, but I, I tell you, what uh, has impressed me the most was not just that uh, all of these uh, individuals and groups uh, could come together, uh, but they could do it under various conditions of adversity. Uh, uh, you all. Uh, uh, trudging through the, the, the cold and wind uh, last night, uh, meeting in places that we had not uh, intended to, to hold the meeting, but still keeping on purpose and still uh, accomplishing some real progress towards those overall goals. So this has just been a couple of days, uh, but I think uh, it's a, a good testament to the potential uh, for PCORnet to really achieve the kinds of transformational change that, uh, uh, that everyone up here on the stage, and most importantly, all of you think are so important. And really, the, the most important uh, element of that success, what's going to make that, as Bray called it, the first ascent possible, uh, is that enthusiasm for the purpose and sticking with this, even though there are different visions, different ideas, a lot of uh, uh, technical details to work out, uh, sticking with it uh, to make it succeed. Because as, uh, as you heard from, as you all said over the last couple of days, this is too important to fail. Thank you so much for all of your effort over the past couple of days, and thank you in advance for what's going to be a very challenging, but I think uh, potentially transformational next 18 months. And we'll see you soon.